Well, friends, I would rather be preaching on our gospel passage this morning than our Genesis passage. It's the worst Father's Day passage ever. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, but this is where we're at in our sermon series. So last Sunday, we began the summer-long sermon series on the life of Joseph from the Old Testament. We talked about holding our dreams, our visions for the future in our hands before the Lord, our God-given purpose. And to hold those plans or visions loosely before the Lord so that he can shape them and mold them like uh, clay. That we submit our lives to him in this way. And we talked about engaging the discipline of silence, uh, i.e. not blabbermouthing to everyone. Like Joseph did, um, the visions or the dreams that he had. But instead, learning to ponder these things in our hearts, just like Mary did in the New Testament what we receive from the Lord. So this morning, I want to dive into this passage where Joseph is betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. And I want to talk about three things, the vision he received, the valley that he's going through, and then the verity, the truth of the vision being revealed after the valley. Vision, valley, verity. And uh, as we dive into this, at different points you make, remember or even reflect on the valley you find yourself in this morning. Maybe you, re you might remember some difficult seasons of your life in the past, uh, but wherever you're at, my hope is that we can see the Lord leading us even in the midst of a, uh, a shadowy valley, a difficult season of our lives. So let's pray and ask God to meet us as we study his word this morning. Father, we need you. We need you every hour, every minute. You know our uh, vulnerability and our, our fragility in this life. Lord, we call on your name and ask, would you send your spirit to us to be within us, to help us, Lord, to digest your holy word and that your word might bear fruit in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would show us how we can hold on to you in the midst of difficult seasons of our lives, suffering that we're enduring or suffering that we're watching someone else endure. Lord, help us to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the vision that God gave to Joseph, these dreams um, that we read about last week with uh, sheaves of grain bowing down to Joseph's sheaves or the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. It's almost as if God put his hands around 17-year-old Joseph's shoulders and said, through his dreams, one day you will reign over a nation and everyone will bow down to you and be your subjects. It's as if that's what God is speaking to 17-year-old Joseph. I intend to use you to save thousands of lives. So you must learn to be a good leader, a humble leader. There's a difficult road to fulfill this vision, but I will be with you every step of the way. That's the vision. Now, all of that isn't like there in the dream. It's not obvious, but reading through Genesis, we are looking back on this passage, knowing that this is what God's message is to Joseph through these dreams. But the valley starts today in this passage. The difficult, horrible season begins today. Jacob sends Joseph, 17-year-old, not working with his brothers, wearing a many-colored many, uh, robe that indicates that he isn't meant for hard field work, um, something that his brothers resent terribly. And he goes off to find his brothers with the sheep in the pasture and to check in on them. And we also know from last week's passage that he has a bad habit of tattling on his brothers, giving bad report on his brothers to his dad, which continues the resentment and bitterness of his brothers. We talked about the mixed family dynamic. These are not all full brothers. They're half brothers. And there's, you know, issues around who's going to receive the inheritance, who's going to receive the favor from dad. And everybody sees that Joseph is the favored son. So he goes out to see what his 10 brothers are doing and to give a report back to his father. But his brothers see him approaching while he's still a far way away. And out of their jealousy, 
actually out of their hate. I mean, there has to be hate here and rage for them to begin to plot how to get rid of him, how to murder their brother. But Reuben, uh, it's mentioned in our passage. You may want to uh, look at the passage as we go through it together on page five and six. Reuben is the firstborn. Reuben's the oldest. I imagine Reuben may be at the very youngest in his 30s, but he's probably in his 40s. Uh, Reuben is the oldest, and he's very concerned about what these nine other brothers are plotting. So Reuben, um, he's alarmed at the plan to kill Joseph and to throw him into a pit where he won't be discovered, where his body will decay and uh, never be found. So he implores them, don't kill Joseph or shed his blood. Let's just put him in the pit still alive. And then it says here in the passage um, in verse 22, so that he could find a way to rescue Joseph and return him to his dad. The passage indicates to us what Reuben is thinking. He's wanting to not let this terrible thing take place. And uh, Reuben's hoping to find some way to save him from certain death. The brothers agree to Reuben's alteration of the plan, but not because they don't want to kill him, rather just to sort of uh, put a postponement on their murder plans. So they agree, they tear off his robe, they strip him, they throw him alive down into the dry well, and they carry out their plan to deceive their dad, Jacob. They, they first sit down to a meal, right? They're going to eat while Joseph's like in the bottom of the well, crying out, begging for his life. They are planning a cruel deception on Jacob. They tear up the robe, they cover it in blood and that they have killed, and they, they prepare to send it back to their father. They have plotted to share a lie, a terrible deception to Jacob the dad. And Reuben, for all of his hopes to save Joseph's life and restore him to his dad, he still becomes complicit in the lie. He doesn't tell his dad the truth. He becomes part of this deception along with the other nine brothers, his moral resistance at this point now failing. And then they see the caravan of Ishmaelites. Now these are the descendants of the other son of Abraham. If you remember, Abraham had his son Isaac miraculously through Sarah in their old age. But before that, when Sarah had given up hope, she offered her maidservant to Abraham to bear a child and they, they had Ishmael together. And so these are the descendants, descendants of Ishmael coming. And Judah, Judah is now the fourth born son. And we recognize Judah because Judah is the son of Jacob through whom the Messiah is later born. The Messiah we know as the Lion of Judah. So Judah is the fourth born, his uh, son, and, uh, and the father of the tribe of Judah. Um, instead of wasting Joseph and concealing his blood, he persuades the brothers, let's not waste him. Let's sell him and make a profit. Then at least his life won't go to complete waste, right? And so he convinces them to sell Joseph, their 17-year-old brother, in the bottom of the well to these Ishmaelites to do whatever terrible thing they want to do with him for 20 shekels of silver. 20 shekels of silver. Today, 20 shekels of silver is worth about $5. Back in 1900 BC, those 20 shekels of silver were probably worth approximately $200. Just as you, you know, try to understand economy and how the value of silver and gold have shifted over the years. This dramatic turn for Joseph is the beginning of a severe valley uh, that will bring a lot of grief in his life and a lot of grief in the lives of those that love him, particularly his father and Benjamin, the youngest boy. Um, Benjamin and Joseph were uh, best friends. To become a king, he has to first become a slave and a servant. 
There's a similarity here to the trajectory of Joseph, Joseph's life as a similarity to, to Jesus's life, uh, to the character of Jesus. And, and they share a similar painful path. Many lessons for Joseph and for us to learn about here, about what it means to lead the people of God. Jesus was also betrayed by those he loved. He was arrested by a group of men, just as Joseph was arrested by these group of brothers. Jesus was stripped of his garments, just as Joseph was. And then Jesus was killed. Um, Joseph was thrown into a pit alive. This is where the verity, the truth of God's call gets revealed. Vision, valley, verity. The truth of his call is not about position or power or status, which is what the dream initially communicates. Everyone in all of creation will bow down to you. I'm going to have such position, such power, uh, status. But that's not the truth of the vision. The truth of the vision is that God wants to speak about his character being transformed, about spiritual formation, about who he becomes, not what he becomes. Does that make sense? Who Joseph becomes is entirely more important to God than what he becomes. And this is true for all of us. While we might be concerned with what, what we get in life or what position we can aspire to or becoming the greatest or, uh, I mean, all of my children are, are definitely consumed with becoming great in some way. Musician, actor, Lego master. I mean, they all want to become great. But God is concerned with who they become, how they are transformed in their inward being. And that's what parents are concerned about. So I want to talk about the act of betrayal here that Joseph experiences. I don't know how many of you have experienced betrayal like this. I don't know if you've ever felt betrayed by a family member or a friend in your life. It's very painful when someone you love or care for or have sacrificed for stabs you in the back, betrays you, uh, maligns your character in some way. People who are betrayed, like Joseph, they wonder if they can ever trust family or friends again. Trust is completely severed. And it's severed in such a way that you don't just distrust the person that betrayed you, you're uncertain of all of your relationships. It casts a shadow on all of the trusted relations you have in your life. And you don't know that if, if you become vulnerable with another person, will they betray you in the same way? Will you get hurt again? Betrayal leaves the victim questioning all of their relationships because it's natural to want to protect yourself from experiencing such pain again. So victims close their hearts off. They withdraw from relationships. Jesus went through betrayal. He, he, um, he goes through this moment, this dramatic picture in the Garden of Gethsemane where he knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows who's going to betray him. And he still allows that man to get close enough to him to kiss him on the cheek. I mean, that's vulnerability. He doesn't know if the guy's going to hit him, stab him. He doesn't know how he's going to be hurt. But in that moment, this kiss may have perhaps been more painful than any other violent action because it was the utter face of duplicity, of deception, pretending to love while stabbing in the back. I mean, it's a terrible event, uh, Judas's kiss. But Jesus's ability to receive that is a level of virtue that we can only hope to attain. That kind of stillness to stand still while being betrayed. 
When Joseph sat at the bottom of the well, listening to his brothers argue and debate about actually killing him, I don't know if he was listening to them talk about who's going to do it, how they're going to do it, what terrible thing um, uh, they would describe the actual murder event. And he's down there probably shouting, begging for his life, pleading with them not to do this terrible thing. I can only imagine that he felt like this is the end, right? He's hearing them talk about murdering him. Is this my last hour? Is this the last day? Have I seen my father for the last time? What about Benjamin? What about my mother? What kinds of thoughts were going through his head? This is the end. His life is over. His life as he knew it did end that day because he wouldn't see his mother or his father for another, I don't know, a couple of decades. He wouldn't see his brothers for several decades. His life as he knew it was over. Some might say that it was worse than death, becoming a slave. The whole process of watching your family as you're pulled out of the pit, watching your brothers exchange you for money and then to be tied up and, and forced to walk away. That, that started a journey of about 450 miles that he would have to walk. It would take at least two weeks, if not longer, depending on the pace that they took, to the foreign land of Egypt, which Joseph had only heard about at that point. I just can't imagine the emotional impact for him every step of those 450 miles, what it felt like to walk as a slave, reflecting on what your family had just done to you. Did he sob as he walked? Did he collapse? Sometimes we feel like we're at our wit's end. Circumstances have it in such a way that you feel like this is the end of your life. I don't know if it's a, a diagnosis or a family member that is um, facing death, where you feel like your life as you know it's over. Maybe you have faced death directly, face to face, and wondered, is this it? Maybe it was a lost job where you just can't imagine life getting any better after you've lost your job, or perhaps the death of a spouse. How can you ever get over the death of your spouse or the death of your child? How can you get through it? Maybe like Jacob, you're crying out, I wish I were in Sheol with my son. How can I live without him? There was a 76-year-old woman this week named Bella Yolanda. She died last week in Ecuador. But to everyone's surprise, at her wake, they heard her knocking on her coffin. You think it might be over, or someone else might think it's over for you. But family of God, if you're sitting here this morning, God isn't finished with you yet. There's still more to your story. There's still more in front of you. And God was just beginning with Joseph. So I offer two takeaways for you this morning from our study of Genesis 37. If God has given you a vision, there's often a valley to walk through. Maybe it's the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe it's a difficult season, a turbulent season, chaotic season. There may be depression or despair involved in the valley that follows the vision or the dream or the God-given purpose that you've received. There's usually suffering involved. My friends, don't give up. If you have given up, you can resume where you left off, right? No one knows or understands what God is doing when they are in the valley. You can't see anything when you're in a valley. You can see everything when you're on the mountaintop, but when you go into the valley, the shadows are long as the sun rises and sets. It's dark. Often mist hangs out down there in the valley. It's hard to see anything where you're going. You don't even know which direction you're headed in. The second takeaway would be the valley reveals the verity. The valley reveals the truth of God's vision, he, his call on your life. 
The vision is usually followed by the valley, and in the valley is the verity, the truth of God's call. The third takeaway, the end result for the Lord is virtue. God wants to transform you and to grow virtue in your soul. The historic church, the ancient church, right before medicine, um, modern medicine, before psychology, the historic church always responded to soul sickness, to struggles with sinful addictions by prescribing spiritual disciplines that grew virtue in the soul. That was their main goal. You can overcome if you grow virtue in your soul. And they would prescribe spiritual disciplines. Go and have solitude. Go practice silence. Go fast from food. Go do some spiritual discipline that would grow virtue. And as virtue grew, they saw it as vice being overcome. Virtue and vice. And so... God wants each one of us to be fruit-bearing. He wants to grow virtue in our soul. He's more concerned with who you become than what you become. And so the end result for us with God's vision in our lives, the valley we have to go through, the truth, the verity of that call is virtue acquisition. He grows virtue in our souls and makes us fruit-bearing, not focusing on the results of our lives, but on who we become because a person of virtue produces fruit without any effort. In fact, a person who produces fruit may be unaware of the fruit that they're dropping left and right like a fruit tree, just completely unaware of the gifts of their life that affect other people. That's sort of what it means to be fruit bearing. Uh, The fruit of a fruit tree, may I remind you, is not actually for the tree. The tree doesn't benefit from its own fruit. The fruit is for others, always for others. And that's the fruit of our lives. Fruit is a byproduct of living your life in the light. The fruit is an offering for the world, for the hungry, the poor, the underserved, those who have nothing to eat in their lives. That's what the fruit of our life is for. So what kind of people do we want to be? If we want to be virtuous, Christ-filled people, we have to receive the vision from God, the purpose for our life. And friends, there isn't just one purpose for your life. Every season has a new purpose, right? You move, you have many stages of your life, many ages of your life, and at every age, There's a purpose for your life. What's the purpose that God's given you for your life right now? What's your purpose for these weeks and months ahead? There is a God-given purpose for you. Who do you want to be? If we want to be virtuous, Christ-filled people, we have to receive the vision from God for right now. We have to descend with Christ into the valley and receive the truth, the verity of our call as we grow in virtue.